Hello and welcome to this film which is all about calorimetry and it's the fourth in a series of films about standard level energetics. I suppose whereas up until now we've been looking at what enthalpy changes are, we're now going to start looking at how we might actually measure them. So what we'll hopefully understand by the end of this film is that there is actually a difference between heat and temperature and that we can relate these two quantities, heat and temperature, by using something called the specific heat capacity of a substance. And if we can do that, we might be able to then go away and use temperature changes that we obtain from experiments to calculate enthalpy changes for chemical reactions. Now, at the end of the last film, very briefly, uh, we mentioned the fact that not only can enthalpy changes be calculated, but they can also be measured in experiments. And if we're going to be able to do that, then we have to be able to measure heat changes, because remember, enthalpy gets turned into heat in chemical processes, or heat gets turned into enthalpy, you could say. Now, if I said to a student, go away and, uh, without telling them much information, go away and measure a heat change for me, they'd probably ask me to borrow a thermometer. And there's a slight misunderstanding going on there, because what the student would be doing would be to be conflating temperature and heat, or understanding them to mean exactly the same thing. But there is actually a slight difference, and it's quite a subtle difference, and we'll gloss over it, but let's just say for now that the import, most important difference between temperature and heat energy is that temperature is measured in Kelvin, whereas heat, being a form of energy, is measured in joules or kilojoules. And we might also be able to imagine that if the enthalpy of a system is converted into heat, or if heat is converted into enthalpy, that the enthalpy change, which is also measured in joules or kilojoules, might be related to a heat change. Okay? And, what's more, if we can connect a heat change to a temperature change, or convert a temperature change into a heat change, then we might be on our way to calculating an enthalpy change. But to do this, we need to know something about a quantity called the specific heat capacity of a substance. Now I'm going to pick out just one from this list and that is the specific heat capacity of water. And it's given here as being 4186 joules for every kilogram per, so joules per kilogram per Kelvin. So the specific heat capacity C is measured in joules per kilogram per Kelvin, but it could also be measured in joules per uh, or, sorry, in kilojoules per kilogram per Kelvin. This would be now telling me how many kilojoules I have to supply to raise the temperature of one kilogram of a substance by one Kelvin. So I have to put in 4.18 kilojoules, or 4.186, 4.18 is what's in the IB data booklet, 4.18 kilojoules of heat have to be supplied to raise the temperature of one kilogram of water by one Kelvin. Or we might also write that differently as 4.18 joules for every gram of water for every Kelvin temperature rise. Okay, And we can see now that we've got a quantity which connects temperature changes and energy changes because it's got the units joules and it's got the units Kelvin. So now, if I can devise an experiment that will measure a temperature change, I can convert that into a heat change, and away I go. I'm on my way to finding an enthalpy change. And also, I'll need to measure the temperature change in a substance whose mass I know, because mass was in that um, specific heat capacity as well. Now, here are some pictures of crude calorimeters. Okay? These are devices used for measuring heat changes. And in this one on the left, you can see that you've got a styrofoam cup, right? And that's quite a good insulator. We've got some water inside here, and we've got a thermometer in there. Okay, this is called a coffee cup calorimeter, um, because we're measuring a heat change by using this temperature change on the thermometer to measure how much heat was supplied to this water. We've got a chemical system dissolved in the water. If the water's temperature changes, then we can figure out how much heat we must have supplied to the water using a simple formula. Here we've got a different chemical reaction taking place. This reaction is now outside of the calorimeter. Believe it or not, this 
Dr. Pepper can is the calorimeter. We've got a chemical reaction going on here. It's turning its enthalpy into heat. We can see this is an endo exothermic change here. It's burning. And this heat is being transferred to some water in this Dr. Pepper can. And then we're measuring a temperature change. Okay. Now you might think, well, that's not very accurate for a number of reasons because well we're heating the air around the calorimeter and quite a lot of this heat will just escape and um, we're also heating the can as well as the water and um, in here we might be losing some heat from the surface of the water not too much from the styrofoam cup but there's definitely inaccuracies here okay so when these calculated values that were oh, sorry not these calculated these experimental values that we find in data booklets are found they're done using calorimeters that are much much more accurate that is to say they try and remove a lot of the losses that we saw in those crude calorimeters so here is a bomb calorimeter here's a photograph of one and here's a schematic diagram of one this is now extremely well insulated from the surrounding atmosphere it's got a motorized stirrer in it there's the motor and this is stirring the water now water is a notoriously bad conductor of heat so if we measure the temperature change in one part of the water it might not be the same as the temperature change in another so this stir is stirring the water to make sure it's all at the same temperature and that any temperature change that we measure is indicative of how much heat we've supplied to the water we're also making sure that we don't have to seal this calorimeter after the reaction has started by getting the reaction started using electrical leads. So here is our chemical reaction. It's being triggered without having to open the calorimeter and allow anything to get in or out. Okay. Now you don't need to know the details of a bomb calorimeter. I'm just showing you that there are ways of constructing calorimeters that remove quite a lot of the losses. But it's actually important to be aware of the fact that calorimeters will usually involve quite a lot of heat loss. Now, if we want to measure an enthalpy change from a temperature change, it's important to know a formula. And the formula that is printed on the data sheet is Q equals M times C times delta T. Delta we've seen before, this simply means a change. T, that's the temperature. C we've also seen before, this is the specific heat capacity. And M is the mass. Crucially, this is the mass of the substance that is being heated, not the mass of the substance that's being used to heat it. Okay, And this is a heat that we are calculating. So this will be in joules. But remember, if the enthalpy, change, if the enthalpy of a system changes, it's usually turning that enthalpy into heat. So by finding the heat change, we're also going to find an enthalpy change. Let's just check that this works for us well if we've got a heat or an enthalpy change measured in joules and we take a mass and we multiply it by the specific heat capacity remember this is for example joules per gram per kelvin and then we multiply that by a temperature change well this mass is going to cancel this mass this temperature is going to cancel this temperature and we'll be left with joules equals joules so that makes sense okay but remember this formula here is actually printed on the data sheet what's important is knowing how to use it so let's have a look at a quick example of how we might use this formula we've got a glass beaker containing 500 centimeters cubed of water and we're heating it on a Bunsen for half an hour and the temperature rose from 10 degrees centigrade to 97 degrees centigrade. Calculate the heat released by the reaction. Well, let's just remember that this is the mass of the substance that's being heated. So this is the water. This is the specific heat capacity, which is given to us on our data sheet, or will be given to us in the question, but we also saw it in the table earlier. And this is the temperature change in Kelvin. But remember, one Kelvin is the same as one degree centigrade. So if I can find the temperature change here in degrees centigrade, I know it in Kelvin. OK, so calculate the heat released by the reaction. This is going to be calculated by taking the mass of water. But I only know the volume of water, unfortunately. But what's useful to know is that one centimeter cubed of water weighs one gram. So Q equals 500 grams times the specific heat capacity. The specific heat capacity of what? Well, the specific heat capacity of water. 
because that's what we're heating. So times 4.18 joules per Kelvin per gram. I could have used 4.18 kilojoules per Kelvin per kilogram, but I know the mass in grams, so I might as well use that. By the way, this is also known, 4.18 joules is also known as a calorie, right? Because that's because one calorie is how much energy we need to supply to raise the temperature of one gram of water by one Kelvin. But anyway, times the temperature change, which we can see here, is going to be 87 Kelvin. Okay, and we can see the Kelvins are going to cancel, the grams are going to cancel, and I'll be left with joules. And if I do that, I find that I've got 181,830 joules. But just be careful here, because if you're in an IB paper, you've got to use the right number of significant figures. We've only got two significant figures here. So I'm actually going to turn this into kilojoules and two significant figures, and that's 180 kilojoules. So that's how we use that formula and how we can find an nth we change because remember this heat that the reaction released is going to be the same as the nth we change, assuming that the energy didn't get converted into any other forms. Now how accurate is that thing we've just calculated? Well, remember, if you're asked in an exam to say what sort of errors there might have been involved here, well, we didn't stir the water. We're heating the, uh, the water in a glass beaker, which is a terrible conductor of heat, and we're heating it on a Bunsen burner, so we're probably heating up the tripod and the gauze as well as well as the air around it. Okay, so this isn't going to be a very accurate calculation, and we should be aware of that when we do these type of calculations and exams, right? If we uh, if we find that our experimental value is very different from the calculated value, this would be one reason that we could give for why this um, discrepancy has arisen. Okay, remember that what we were trying to do in this film was to understand that there's a difference between heat and temperature and that we can turn temperature changes into heat changes by using a quantity known as a specific heat capacity of a substance. And um, what we basically did at the end there was we calculated an enthalpy change by using a temperature change. So remember, we can kind of equate the heat change with an enthalpy change because we're assuming that any change in enthalpy will result in a change in heat energy. As usual, any questions or comments, please feel free to come and ask me or to post a comment on YouTube.